Good morning, church family. Go ahead and stand with us. We're glad you're with us this morning. We're keeping things a little simple this morning, which means that your voices need to sing even louder than before. This morning, we are here to give Jesus all of the praise, all of the glory. So if you will, just bow your heads for a moment. God, we welcome you in this place. God, whatever it is that we face, that we've been going through, Lord God, we lay it at your feet this morning. We invite your presence to work in our midst. And so help us, Lord God, to focus our hearts on you, to give you all of the praise. And as we worship you, Lord God, would your spirit do a work in us that only you can do. We invite you to have your way, King Jesus. You are welcome in this place. Amen. All right, church. Let's sing as loud as we can this morning, all right? Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Let's edify one another with his praises this morning. Amen? Let's sing. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a Declare this with me. Heaven comes 
welcome you, King Jesus. Now, church family, we have been through this season of really intentionally focusing on prayer, on inviting the Lord to do a work in our church. And so this morning, as we continue to sing, I wanna invite you to do more than just sing a song this morning. So if you would, just um, wherever you are, if you would just close your eyes for a moment and invite the Holy Spirit to speak because we here believe that we need a fresh wind of the Spirit of God in this place. We don't need more tradition, we don't need religion, we need Jesus and we need him to do something in our midst and so we're asking for him to just bring revival in this place and so God, that starts with our hearts turned to you and so we invite you now, God, to bring a fresh wind of your Spirit. Let's fix our eyes on him as we sing this morning. Thank you, Jesus.
Church, let's just sing one more time. Let's invite him to bring a fresh wind of his spirit this morning. That as we open our hearts to his word, that we hear from him and him alone. Surely. Well, every voice, one more time, just sing it to him as a prayer this morning unto the Lord. We need a fresh wind. The fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out. You pour your The power of your presence, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Jesus, would you pour your spirit out upon us this morning? We give you our hearts and we give you this morning and we ask you to speak to us. In your mighty name we pray these things, amen. Go ahead and take a quick seat this morning. We're glad you're with us today. Yeah, I'll echo what Josiah said. We are very glad that you've chosen to worship with us here today. Whether you are a longtime member of 30, 40, 50 years or shorter than that, or whether you are a longtime visitor or a first-time guest, we are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us, and we want to be able to connect with you. Um, the best way to do that probably it's just after worship is over, just come down. I'll, I'll be around down here. Josiah will be around. Just come down and connect with us there. We'd love to be able to do that. Those of you that watch your watches and you want, you want to get more steps in, if you want to get connected, you're welcome to go across the lobby to the next steps room and get connected there as well. Gary will be there. He's preaching with us. He will be there this morning after worship is over. You can connect with him as well. So we'd love to get you connected in the life of our, in the, of the life of our church. Um, one of the things I want to give you an update on are D groups, discipleship groups. We have started a discipleship launch in mid-February. Just want to give you an update on that. It went really well. We had over 50 people there from the church at that launch meeting just to find out more about it. Since that meeting, we've had, I think we've got about seven or eight groups now that have either started or will be starting in the next week or two. We've got another seven or eight people said they would be interested in starting a group. We've got another 20 or so people said they're interested in being part of a group and some other people, hey, I just wanna learn more. If you weren't able to be at that, you want to know more, come find me afterwards. I'd love to visit with you about that and about the simple next step you might take in your discipleship journey. As we learn to follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and join his mission. One of the things that's very important we have coming up in the life of church is Easter Sunday. That weekend, we have quite a bit going on and great opportunities to invite that one person that you've had on your mind or that God may be placing on your mind to invite that one person or that one family. You can do more than that, but I'm just asking just one. Think of that one person you could invite in to be a part of what's going on here at Easter. Good Friday service on Friday night is surrounded by an interactive experience. It's good for families. It's good for friends. 
to be able to go through on journey to the cross and then end with flowering of the cross. That's at 5.30 on Friday night. Lord's Supper service at 6.30. And then when that's over about 30 minutes later, the interactive experience will be open again for another hour. So you can come take part in that. Please do that. Invite someone to do that with you. Saturday morning, those of you that have, eat, have lots of energy and like to hunt Easter eggs, we've got an Easter egg hunt for the kids. Sorry, adults. But if you don't have that energy anymore anyway, you can just come watch and cheer them on. But there will be lots of things to do for the kids that morning in addition to the Easter egg hunt. That's at 930 on, uh, on that Saturday morning. And then Sunday morning, 930, we're going to worship all together, worship our risen Savior. So come, please be a part of that and invite, invite that one person. Thank you for the, for the way that you consistently steward what God has given you. We're so very appreciative of that. Um, and really, it all comes back to asking God to pour his spirit out. And that's what we want as a church right now. We want to follow his lead. We want it to be his will, not ours, in everything that we do. Join with me in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you. For, you, for the gift of your son and for, for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for the way that you reached down to us to redeem us, to bring us to you. We ask that a fresh wind and fresh fire fills this place. We just ask that your Holy Spirit come and fill this place. In Jesus' name, amen. We are glad to be with you today, and uh, you may not know me or have been introduced. I'm Gary Smith. I pastored in Arlington, Texas for a few years at a fielder church there. In fact, still I'm on the teaching team at that church. We're at three or four locations, and, and uh, so uh, I've been preaching here periodically when Ellis would be in this room. Oftentimes, he wanted a live person next door, and so for the past a year or two, uh, I've been uh, a part of that, and uh, then uh, with Ellis' res resignation, uh, of course, uh, you've been getting two different preachers, and they've put together the live stream now, so we can try and do this live, so this is new to the church, and uh, uh, not new to me, we do that at Fuel with our online stuff. And uh, so I'm just glad to be with both rooms at the same time, okay? And uh, just give you a little idea of what's going on is I'm in the middle of a series called Final Instructions. Uh, taking the last experiences of Jesus when he was teaching the disciples and all the things he did at the very end. And final instructions are usually the most important ones. And so we're looking at that. Now, next week, uh, we're going to literally gather around the cross. We're going to have a cross on the stage, and I'm going to sit down and just talk to you about the cross. And I hope it gets you ready for the Friday night service. Please do not miss that, okay? You, you cannot experience Resurrection Sunday until you go to the cross. And so please be here for that. It's going to be a great time. And then on Easter, we're all going to be together in the other room. And uh, then we'll see what the Lord wants to do right now. I have a message out of the book of Acts with the last words of Jesus to those disciples. Uh, we'll probably be going there unless the Lord leaves different. But today... Today we're going to be looking at a story that is very, very famous in the Scripture. It's probably one that everyone knows about. But the best way to introduce this is to look at a Scripture verse that is one of the most uh, clear commands in all the Bible. It's found in the book of Romans. If you have the book of Romans, open it up quickly. If we're going to look at these first two verses for a moment and kind of use it as a jumping off place to get to where we're going. But Romans says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Here's the verse. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're going to look today at someone who got conformed by the world in a dramatic way, transferred by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Listen to what the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is 
perfect. That word uh, conformed right there is a word that was used to shape something. It was the idea of maybe someone who was cutting out a piece of cloth, ladies, and making a pattern, and the pattern was something that you'd cut around, or maybe a piece of clay, something that is formed, is something that is pressured to be formed in a certain way. It's even the image of the blueprint of a building that you build to conform to whatever that blueprint would say. Well, we're going to look this morning at a guy that was shaped by the world for a point in his time that almost destroyed him. His being conformed to what was going on around him was something that almost destroyed his entire life. His name was Peter. What we're going to look today is the story of him denying Jesus. And you remember Jesus had been at the Garden of Gethsemane, had been arrested, taken to Caiaphas' house. And Peter and John, we find in the Gospel of John, John and Peter followed him. But Peter got closer than anyone else while standing apart from Jesus. And and we're going to look at how this experience was formed. Look at Mark chapter 14, the Gospel of Mark, which is where our text will be today. I want you to begin reading with me in verse 26. When they had sung a hymn, they went out from the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to me, You will fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But I will be raised up, and I will go before you in Galilee. And I like Peter. You know, the guy, he usually takes one foot out of his mouth to put the other foot in, okay? And he said, even though they fall away, even though everybody else does it, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, I must die with you. I will not deny you. And they all said the same to Jesus. And then look at verses 53 and 54. This is after Jesus had been arrested. Then they led Jesus to the high priest. All the chief priests and elders and the scribes came together. Verse 54. And Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards, warming himself by the fire. Now let's look what happened. Verse 66. And Peter was below in the courtyard. One of the servant girls of the high priest came. Seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the Nazarene. But he denied it, uh, saying, I I neither know or understand what you even mean. And he went away into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began to say again to the bystander, This man was one of them. But again he denied it. After a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Peter, certainly you are one of them. You're a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself. In other words, what he was saying, you know, let me be cursed if I'm not telling you the truth. Let me be taken right now. And he began to swear, I do not know this man of whom you're speaking. And immediately the rooster, rooster crowed a second time. Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Very sobering last few words of this story. And it said, Peter broke down and wept. In fact, some of the translations say he wept bitterly. Peter's denial. It's been reported on, talked about, preached about for centuries. It's been something that the Christianity has looked at very, very often. And I know as we do it, it's easy at this point in time to throw stones at Peter. I mean, how could this guy that Jesus had helped walk on water and Jesus had taught and fed and all this stuff that he did say, how could this guy deny Jesus like this? How could he be someone like this? But you look at this guy, and I can identify with him because you find him wavering in these last hours. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Who is the guy who took out his sword? cut off somebody's ear, said, I'm ready to die for you. In other words, what he had said early, I'm ready to do that. You, you see this boldness and this courage. And then you go to Caiaphas' house. By the way, I've been to those two places, and you literally can look from one of them across to the other one. There in that courtyard, I've stood in that courtyard many times, right there next to his house. There he was in that courtyard. And By the way, it was quite courageous to follow Jesus at that point. But how in the world do you see this guy at one moment in Gethsemane being so strong? And then right here at Caiaphas' house, just a little servant girl is is doing this. This guy who was willing to fight to death, this guy who was willing to die for Jesus, suddenly 
is being intimidated by the world that's around him. In other words, one moment, he was ready single-handedly to fight the Roman soldiers. And here we are at Caiaphas' house. He's this guy who's backing away. I, I, I look at this. And I see this inconsistency in just a few hours. And, and as I, I've studied this text and studied this, uh, you, you begin to say, why, why in the world do you see this with this guy, Peter? Why, why in the world do you, do you see this man who had been so close to Jesus, being willing to die and then running from him and even cursing himself and denying that Jesus is there? Well, I, I, I could sum it up in one sentence for you. Peter had yet to get what was really going on. Peter had yet to understand what was really happening with him and being someone who followed Jesus. Think about his life for just a minute. Here's a guy that three years earlier was just a Galilean fisherman. As you know, in that day and time, a Galilean was a, the, the, the lower class. Fisherman was, was also down on the food chain pretty far. This guy was out here just doing his job, raising money for his family, living there in Galilee, where he was from Bethsaida. And along comes Jesus, this guy. And he says to him, come, come, I want to make you fishers of men. And Peter wrestles with that and, and follows Jesus. And, and just think what happens in those three years. He watched Jesus do miracle upon miracle. He watched him walk on water. He watched him calm the storm. He watched him take a few loaves and fishes and, and, and feed the multitudes. He watched him raise people from the dead. He watched him teach as no man had ever taught. Can you imagine the excitement that was building in Peter that this could be the one? This is the Messiah that everyone had looked for and promised. And, and yet their idea of a Messiah was someone who would come and conquer the Romans and everybody else, set up a government, a, a religious government, and, and they would control the world because the Messiah had come. And yet he would, wasn't seeing any of that with Jesus. Can you imagine the confusion that he felt? That he saw the miracles. He saw there on the Mount of Transfiguration the Heavenly Father speak to him. And yet he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane. The crowd comes, the mob comes to get him. This is Jesus' moment. You read in one of the Gospels that they literally fell back. This was Jesus' moment to take over. And what did he do? He just surrendered to the mob, to the religious leaders. Peter had seen that throughout his life many times. Jesus, this guy who in a moment could have called 10,000 angels, just did what? He healed that servant whose ear he took off. He allowed them to bind him. Peter followed, and he watched him, and he was expecting at any moment for Jesus to turn it around. And he gets to that trial, and he's standing outside that window looking in there at the trial, and he's watching Jesus be tried, watching him being spit upon, watching him be mocked, all those things they were doing. He's expecting him to do something, and he doesn't. He says he was like a lamb, a sheep before the slaughter. And he's surrendering to that. In his trial, he's being accused of blasphemy. Now, Peter knew what that meant. If they convicted him of blasphemy, death. And so he realized that in a few minutes, in a few hours, this one that he had followed would be going to die. And they, were to, they, they put those people on a cross. And so Peter's seen all of this happening. And instead of him establishing that kingdom that he wanted to be so much a part of, wanted to be a leader in that kingdom, Jesus was surrendering to someone to die. You know what Peter began to think? Well, goodness, I'm not, if he's going to die, I'm not going to die. If he's going to die, not me. I can go on back and catch fish. I can have another life. And this servant girl comes along, and she starts talking, and he thinks, my, I thought I was on the winning team. Now I'm on the losing team. In other words, this group of people have control of Jesus. And Peter, this great, courageous guy a few hours before, suddenly is going, oh, wait, wait a minute here. I'm reevaluating this. And what you begin to feel is that crowd, that world around Peter is conforming him, causing them to think about Jesus, maybe like they thought about Jesus. They're shaping him in this moment. And you begin to look at that, and you begin to see that Peter is a guy who suddenly, instead of being transformed, He's a guy that is being conformed. And, and yet, you guys, when I look at this text, I, I would admit to you that I can identify with this more than I'd want to admit. 
<laughs> in other words, coming in here today and being with you in this church, it's real, real easy to be religious. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I love that song Josiah just sang, Raise a Hallelujah. We have family songs that we pick out every year, and it's our family song. This is our family song for the year, okay? We love that song of what it says and everything. It is wonderful to be with Christian friends and talk about the things of God. But I'm like you. I'm like Peter. Sometimes I get out here into the world, and I discover the world is shaping me more than God shaping me. Do you ever feel that? In other words, when God provides money for you, who shapes how you're going to spend your money? Is it about a world that says to you, have more, have more, have more, and you'll be happy? Go for the gusto type world? Or do we see money as Jesus sees it? The transformation of our mind is thinking about it differently. I find very often in my life I'm just as worldly about my money as anybody in the world, okay? The world shaped our thinking. We do that in relationships. The world tells us when somebody wrongs us, we get them back. We get our pound of flesh. We have a right when someone's wronged us to get what we want out of it. And it's the world shaping our mindset. Where Jesus talked about forgiving. How many times? How many times? How many times? Forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. I don't know about you, when I began to doubt Jesus, I began to waver in that way. And my ambitions become ambitions not that are godly, they're worldly. The way I live life, the way I live my marriage, the way I do everything seems to be shaped by this world. And what can happen to us is we can enjoy these Sunday mornings in which we get with God's people and hopefully our mind is being transformed so we will discover and live that will out there. But if the truth be known, people followed us we're more like the world than we are like Jesus and the world watches us and we seem to fit in as good there as we fit in here and it's a person that's wavering between two positions do you find yourself there I do well I began to look at this and I began to say okay how in the world can I make my life more consistent to be what God wants how can I be more like Peter at Gethsemane than Peter at Caiaphas' house? How can I be somebody that, that the world sees as, as living a different life? Not, not in an obnoxious way, but looking at life differently. And the world sees an attitude about life that is something God would have us do. I, I picked out some things out of Peter's life that I believe would help us. First of all, I think we have to become, listen to this word, convinced that Jesus is who he says he is. In fact, you could write in front of that word convinced, really convinced. Okay? Now, what does the Bible say about Jesus? Son of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, came to this earth and for three years did incredible miracles, and then went to a cross to die for our sins, and then three days later, what happened? Rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and guess what? That same Jesus is coming back. And one of these days, we'll be in charge of the judgment. You know, we talk about those things in church, don't we? But let me ask you, do you really, 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 really believe that? Because, you see, if you do, it erases doubt. And what it begins to do is to make us feel as though, listen, I can live this faith life out there. Why? Because I know who's in charge. And I know who has my life. The world doesn't have my life. Not some servant girl, not some crowd manipulating me. There is a God who lives in me and is going to meet me and take care of my life and take care of my needs. And when that begins to happen, what begins to see, be seen in our lives is not a world or, or a life that is shaped like everybody else, but a life that is shaped like Jesus. See, I think Peter wasn't convinced <laughs> until he met the risen Savior. <laughs> I think everything up into that moment was preparation for that moment. He would go to that tomb and it was empty. 
He would go to that room of those disciples and Jesus would come through the wall. He would go there to the Sea of Galilee and Jesus would prepare a meal for him. I think Jesus took those 50 days between his resurrection and his ascension and he began to teach those guys what it was really about. And what do we have in Acts chapter 2? This guy that was intimidated by a little servant girl is now standing in the streets of Jerusalem, looking people in the eye, telling them, Jesus is alive. And you can be certain that Jesus is alive. Why? He became convinced. He decided that was true. Now, this same guy stood in front of the Sanhedrin, James and John, and it goes on the book of Acts. And they're the same guys who had sent Jesus to be crucified. And they were shocked at their boldness. Where does that come from? Well, certainly Bible study is good and certainly worship is good and all these things, but there has to be something that happens in your soul that erases doubt in which you're able to say, you know something, I believe this Jesus is who He says He is. Therefore, He's going to impact everything in my life. How I spend my time, my money, my relationships what I do serving the Lord, what I do in God's church, more importantly, what I do in God's world. You see, doubt is erased not by some sermon somebody would preach. Doubt is erased within our soul when God convinces us about what Jesus said about himself is really true. And when that happens, You have a life that instead of being lived with doubt and inconsistency and wavering is now lived with such certainty about what's going on in life. Let me maybe illustrate what I'm talking about, if you would, okay? Sandy and I do something for the last 30 years that has been one of the delights of our life is we take groups to Israel. By the way, your uh, Pastor Ellis is going to be going pretty soon. I just was with Ellis in Israel this past fall and was able to host a group of 40 pastors and wives there. My wife and I go every year. And I want you to know, we have conversations with the people all the time about Israel. They say, well, hey, you know, I want to go sometime. And I say, okay, you know, that's good. Yeah, I want to go. I should go. Yeah, yeah. Is it safe over there? I said, it's safer there than it is at the mall. Okay, I promise you that. Okay. And people will look at me, and they finally will decide to go. And I'll say to them, I promise you when you go, if the Bible does not come alive in new ways to you, we'll give you your money back. Okay. Every single time, here's what happens. After those moments of experiencing that land, and and this Bible here, instead of being something we read about, becomes something we can close our eyes and say, I can close my eyes, and I'm on the Sea of Galilee, and there's Magdala, and there's where Jesus changed the loaves and fishes and fed the 5,000. There's the Mount of Beatitudes. There's where Peter was restored. There's beside his hometown. There's that hill where the pigs ran off the hill and came down. I can stand in Jerusalem, and I can trace the steps of Jesus and feel what he felt as he went there. And this book becomes a three-dimensional book, and they'll stop me at the end of the trip, tears in their eyes saying, I've seen the Word of God like never before in my life. It's because it became more than something in the mind. It becomes something in the soul that comes alive with Him. That's what God wants to do with the truth of His Word. These facts about Jesus are not just boxes we check off with a test. They are truths from God. He was born of a virgin. He did live a sinless life. He did miracles that have been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. He did rise from the dead. And yes, he is coming back. And the more that becomes something we're convinced of, the more and more we'll find ourselves living a life that is consistently standing for Jesus every single day. I think when Peter became convinced, he saw the risen Lord. You say, well, you know, if I could just been there and seen him, I want you to know you have. You have. If you come to know Jesus, you'll find yourself living as God would have you to live more often than you had before. Second thing, second thing I see about Peter is I don't think Peter ever forgot what God had done in his life to change him. And I think for you and me, there's something we need to be constantly remembering is what God has done in our lives to transform us. In other words, when's the last time 
you, you thought through how you came to know Jesus as your Savior. When was the last time you even wrote out that incredible story of that moment when God moved in your life and transformed you and turned you from a sinner to a saint, from lost to saved, from going nowhere to going somewhere where God would have you to go, being someone engulfed in sin, a slave to sin, now someone freed from sin by the glory of God? When was the last time you thought about that forgiveness that God brought to your life at that moment? Peter, and it's recorded in John 21, after he met the risen Savior there in those places, he had gone back to Galilee to fish because he didn't know anything else to do. And you go to that place, they call it Peter's primacy, and you sit right there, and it's where Jesus made that charcoal fire. And Peter was out there swimming, and he saw Jesus, the one he had denied. He didn't wait till the boat cut to shore. He swam to shore. That encounter with Jesus at that moment was the restoration of this man, and he was never the same again. And you add to that Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, you got a guy who has a testimony that is deep and powerful and strong. See, I, I, I'm afraid we have gotten saved and we have gotten over it. I'm afraid we have learned so much how to do church stuff that we have forgotten about the spiritual dynamic that happened in us to bring us to faith in Jesus for me. I was a 19-year-old college student. I was a member of a church. Going to church, played on the softball teams, sang in the youth choir, okay? They didn't ask me to sing very loud, okay? <laughs> Wasn't very good with singing. I can remember one, the only thing I remember as youth choir, I was sitting in the uh, uh, back row with the guys and a girl in front turned around and said, said why don't you guys be quiet so we can sing? I, I married her a few years later, okay? Because <laughs> she was serious about it. I wasn't serious about it. I can take you back to that August evening when the preacher preached about Moses seeing God in the burning bush and he made the comment, any bush will do. God could have come to a rotten, thorny bush or a really nice, pretty bush. The key was God was in the bush. I made up my mind that night. I was that rotten, thorny bush. I needed God in me for my life to be where God wanted it to go. I want you to know, I pray, I will never, never, never get over that. Have you just spent time thinking about that moment of transformation. Maybe today it's never happened. We're going to have an invitation time for you in a moment to come. But even since that's happened, have you chronicled the moments in which God has come through for you, which you've seen that the risen Savior is alive because of what He did in your life? In fact, that's one of the things worship should be for us as a gathering with God's people to celebrate what God's done all week. See, oftentimes for us, it's just singing some songs that words don't mean anything. In reality, it is to be a celebration that we have a risen Savior who was at work in our life and is still at work within our life. And the understanding of that dynamic, the basis of that transformation in our life, ought to be something that as we walk out into this world, there's a consistency about our faith and our courage, a transformation of our mind that we see the world as God sees it. And we don't want to be conformed to it. We want to be transformed by what God's done in our lives. I don't know about you. The best thing we can do is to be constantly rehashing how we met Jesus and what he's done to change our lives on a regular basis because when it happened to Peter, it changed him forever. Never could any slave girl or anyone else intimidate that guy. Why? Because God had done something in his soul that changed him. When he changed him, he no longer wanted to be like the rest of the world. He no longer was as susceptible to being conformed to the world. He was someone who looked like Jesus more and more every single day. So you know something? We need to become convinced about who he is we need to remember what he's done last, and I'll conclude. We also need to be willing, listen to this, very important, be willing to confess 
the many places we have denied Jesus and asked for forgiveness. One of the most important aspects of this text, the last words. He wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. He saw his sin. He saw who he was. He saw how he had been conformed to what was happening around him. Now, he didn't know what to do with it until he met Jesus later. But there on, on that seashore, you remember that time Jesus cooks him a meal. He went from the charcoal fire of Caiaphas' house to the charcoal fire with Jesus. Which one do you want to be at? There Jesus did a charcoal fire. Come here, I'm going to fix you breakfast. Let's talk about life. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Why did he keep asking? Ask him three times. The threes match up. And there at that moment is only Peter could. That confession, that weeping bitterly came to fruition in his understanding that God had a purpose for his life and that this was the Messiah who had died on a cross and rose from the dead. And that Messiah wasn't what they thought he was going to be. He began to get it. That this Messiah was a suffering Messiah who came to this earth to die on the cross for your sins and my sins. And as he began to get that, the power of God comes alive, and then Pentecost happens, and he gets the Holy Spirit. I I look at this, and I wonder, what's going on right here? I'm convinced that this man Peter would have never been where he was in preaching if he had not been where he was in denial and then confession. Because the pain of that confession led him to the place, I don't want to ever be here again. I want to be what God wants me to be. One of the reasons why God leads you and me to faith and repentance is not to harm us. It's to help us get released from it. Because every one of us in this room have places in any of these rooms where we know right now we're conformed to the world. And we look just like everybody else in our language, in our activities, in our dress, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, how we raise our kids, how we do our marriage. And oh, I think what could change us is to face that head on and be willing to confess it as sin. may even cause you to weep bitterly over it may not but what it will do is confession is agreeing with God that what he says in his word is true about our lives and so when God puts his hand on my life in an area that's out of line my confession is when I say yes Lord what you're saying about me is true 1 John 1 9 says if we confess those sins He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I know so often in our lives we need some moments of confession and repentance. In fact, let me make this comment quickly. Do you know the greatest evidence that you were saved back years ago? When you repented and placed faith in Jesus, is you are still repenting and placing your faith in Jesus. Now you say, am I saved over again? No, no. But the same activity that brought me to salvation is what God uses to not let me be conformed to the world, but he uses it so I'll be transformed from the inside and my life will begin to look more like Jesus every single day. But if we're not willing to open our hearts to uh, identifying the moments of denial, we're going to be easy prey to the world. But if we'll be willing to say, Lord, search me and know me. Look in my soul. Look in my heart. Show me those places 
where I waver. Show me the doubt that's causing it. Being willing before God to confess what he has put his hand on. Would you bow your head, please, for just a moment? Everyone in both rooms, bow your head, close your eyes. Let's, let's take a moment. Could we right now? Everyone just quiet before God. What has God put his hand on in your life? The fresh wind and the fresh fire you want for your church will never come until we're willing to be honest about sin and confess it to him. What places in your life has there been denying who Jesus is, what he's done? Maybe how you've spent your money. Maybe your ambitions. We're ambitious people, aren't we? But are ambitions in line with what Jesus said for our life? Sometimes the wrong ambitions can cause us to do some of the wrong things. You might find yourself in that place. Whose approval do you seek today? The crowd? The world? Or Jesus? If you will confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive. Cleanse from all unrighteousness. Just let the Holy Spirit walk His way through this room, through these hearts. And maybe what you need to do right now, no one's looking around. It's just out in front of you, open your hands and say, dear God, I want you. I want you to be all you can be through me. Just open your hands and say, oh God, be free to work in me. Just show me what's really going on in my life. That willingness, the Holy Spirit will gladly do its work. You could be in either one of these rooms today and you realize today you don't have a salvation experience. You don't have a time. You might have been baptized, you might have joined a church, but there's never been that moment when God entered your life transformed you forever and there's evidence of it since that moment. In a moment we're going to have an invitation in both rooms and Bill Webb will be at the worship center. I'm going to be down front here. God's speaking to your heart about a need of Jesus. You come. Maybe it's just to come right here at the front and have someone pray with you. Kneel right here. One of these chairs here at the front of either of these rooms. Let God be speaking today. Let's let God change us from the inside out for His glory. Father, take these moments. Father, we have two rooms full of people today, and what counts is the work of your Spirit. What counts is us being willing to let you be at work. And Father, yes, it involves coming forward in a service, which we don't do much of that in real life, but today, God, I think you're calling us to come confess you. Surrender afresh to you. Confess sin to you. Be transformed by you. God, you're the only one who can do that. So God, today, you be the one who speaks. You be the one who draws people. You are the persuader. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Both of our rooms, let's stand together. We're going to sing together. And you come to the front today and let's talk about your relationship with God. Could we? As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was
You're here.